What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip. You're listening to Homebrewed Christianity, the number one theology podcast on the interwebs. That's right. And today we're going to be talking about evolutionary ethics and the role of religion. Our guest is the one and only Michael Reese. He is a professor of science education at uh, the University College London. Um, he's a bioethicist, educator, journalist, and Anglican priest, and downright good old guy. We're talking about uh, his recent Boyle lecture, which in the world of religion and science is a pretty legit lecture to get the invite to give. Uh, we're going to talk about how ethics is framed and formed in our evolutionary heritage, the role language and rituals play in the formation of the self, um, how humans create fictions that then shape our living and vice versa, the emergence of religion within humanity, the social brain religious practice and how it preceded ethics and belief, how ethics evolved among our species, the nature of humanity's expanding in-group and all that kind of stuff and more. It's an exciting episode, you know? So prepare yourself before we jump in. I got to say a few things. Number one, we are about to kick off um, a reading group with the one and only Robin Henderson Espinoza. And uh, Robin and I are going to be reading three books um, over the next few months. And I, I would love for you to join because it's going to be fun, 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 fun. The first book we're going to be reading is Identity by Francis Fukuyama. And uh, so we'll be talking about uh, the politics of identity, uh, cultural resentment, um, the contemporary challenge in a, uh, you know, multi-ethnic, uh, multicultural, um, contemporary pluralist democracy like what does it mean to have identity how what do we have in common what what are we needing to be recognized all that kind of good stuff so check it out we also are putting together an event this september 27th and 28th in Cary, north carolina um it's called called to be prophets oh yeah robin and i are going to be joined by our friends uh brian mclaren and the one and only steed Davidson. He is the um, Hebrews Bible scholar and dean at McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago. Uh, he studies prophetic literature, post-colonial studies, black theology. Davidson is um, pretty awesome. Like my buddy Dan Pugh, who is a pastor at Christ King Lutheran Church, the um, progressive Lutheran church that's hosting the event. He's like, oh, you got to check out Steed. Steed was the best professor I had. He's amazing, blah, 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 you know, all that nice stuff. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Oh, he didn't even exaggerate. So I'm super excited because Robin, Brian, very dear friends, and then brand new person to the homebrewed community, Steed Davidson, is going to be bringing the goodness. So check it out, uh, September 27th and 28th, um, a uh, call to be prophets event here in North Carolina. Last thing before we jump into the podcast is I want to give a shout out to some new to some new homebrewed Christianity community members. Who who are these homebrewed Christianity members? New to homebrewed community, like they went to homebrewedcommunity.com and joined. Oh, Jonathan has joined. Yes, I love the name Jonathan. And Jeff and Aaron and Dan. Hey Dan. And Philip and Temple. I like Temple. And Scotty. Ah, oh, Scotty is a cool name. And Mark, look, those are the newest members of the homebrewed community. And uh, that's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. Then, and here's the thing. Not only do you get to go to bed saying to yourself, I contributed to making sustainable the greatest theology podcast on the interwebs. You can do that. But on top of that, um, you'll get access to all sorts of things. Like everyone that signed up in the next week or so is going to get the invitation to join our uh, year long intro to systematic theology class for those that are wanting to catch up, learn and uh, gather what it is that so many of the people that come on this podcast learned in divinity school or you want a refresher of sorts. We're going to be introducing the biggest figures, schools of thought and such um, in uh, contemporary theology. They could, you could be a member of that if you're an elder or a bishop. Um, you can be a part of all the reading groups and things and get it sent right into your podcast feed. That is a, a new feature we're about to release. Uh, all that. And, uh, and and then just getting to go to bed, knowing you know, you're a part of the homebrewed community. You have an ecclesiastical title. <laughs> and um, unlike, unlike back in the day where ecclesiastical titles were sold on the DL, these are uh, straightforward. <laughs> all right. Anyway. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Definitely thank you for uh, being part of the few 
the proud that uh, support the podcast each month. Um, and I, I really want to thank Michael Reese for joining. It's a fun conversation. I bet you're going to dig it. So uh, until next week, when I announce some very secret, exciting, super duper new things. Until then, keep it zesty. Yep. Hello, everybody. This is Trip. I'm here with Michael Reese, who is a uh, evolutionary biologist and uh, a, a theologian, um, a super nerd, all the way across in the UK. Friend of Keith Ward, who said I have to talk to you. So that, that's a pretty good recommendation. Trip, that's very generous of you. And uh, as you seem to be the person who's connecting Keith and me most at the moment, you can give me, you can give him my best wishes when you next speak with him. <laughs> all right. So um, you are about to give the Boyle Lectures, which is uh, a pretty famous um, lecture series on religion and science. And so I'm interested. One, that's like a really sweet invitation. So when you think of your own biography as a scientist, as a person of faith, uh, how did you get to become someone that gets that pretty cool invite? Well, well, I'm I'm really surprised that I was asked to give the Boyle Lecture, which nowadays is a single lecture. You're quite right. Back in the 17th century, when they were set up under Robert Boyle's will, they were a whole series of lectures. And as often happens, after a few decades, they fell into abeyance and they got resurrected about 15 or so years ago. And they're now a single one-off lecture. Um, I think what happened was they always want people who can connect science religion. And as you said, my background is evolutionary biology. Um, I'm not what I would describe as a top theologian. So in a sense, I feel very flattered by being asked to do these. But I do know that one thing they like is people who can say something that connects to anybody who might be sitting, listening to an address or a sermon in church, not just to a group of fellow academics. Mm -hmm. and, and your lecture is dealing with the questions around science, religion, and in particular ethics. So it, like coming from your background in the sciences, uh, even before you get to ethics, I think there's a, a popular understanding that is and ought questions have a hard time connecting or that science has this empirical area over here and values questions are over here. How does an evolutionary biologist normally frame that tension? Right. Well, you have gone straight to the absolute heart of the issue, because as you well know and say, mainstream philosophy by and large has been pretty dismissive of what anything to do with the real world could contribute to determining what's right and what's wrong. Now, the the sort of modest claim from evolutionary biology, which you can come back at me and tell me if you are happy with this or not, Trip. but the modest claim from evolutionary biology is that if we just start not so much with what is right or wrong in the world, but what people believe and think is right or wrong, mm -hmm. that's now moving the question from moral philosophy to psychology and sociology. Mm -hmm. And if, like me, you think human beings are the product of quite a long period of evolution, then the way that we behave in groups, sociology, and the way that we judge others in groups, to do with sociology, and the thoughts and beliefs we have ourselves, psychology, will indeed have been molded by a long period of evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. So I'll pause there. But that's only, as it were, part one of the argument. We may want to talk about this for a bit more, but you're quite right. There's then a much more contentious part two, which is, does any of that conversation about what people think is right or wrong connect with what actually is right or wrong? Mm -hmm. Now, when we, when, I mean, almost all examples we have in cultures have people using language of right and wrong. And one of the things that you highlight is that um, that, that we are aware, right, of of the pluralism that evolved in cultures. We are aware of our evolutionary history, but sometimes we don't take into account the way our minds as a species and as groups evolved uh, to, to, you know, attach on and select for what's right and what's wrong and how that functions, um, uh, you know, culturally. And 
and and I think that like that particular issue, if you didn't put it in a religious context, a lot of people might be able to hear it and think about it that um any part of our culture has an evolutionary inheritance, but um there is a uh tendency for religious people to see their own history and their own religious convictions as immediately obvious and connected to these natural intuitions they have that come from God, spirit, culture, or whatever they want to use. Um, when when you think as an evolutionary biologist about the individual asking these questions, um, how do you introduce them to the way um, evolution has so shaped them without necessarily being you know clear to themselves that they have been shaped by evolution? Absolutely. Now, there's a lot in that. The way I think that makes most sense to most people is to talk about how almost all of us favor our close relatives, particularly if we have children, our own children. That's not exactly the most surprising statement of all time. It's a very natural human tendency. If we're going to think about just everyday helping actions or quite major help, by which an evolutionary biology would mean investment. Mm -hmm. So if we literally bring it down to paying college fees, you're in the USA, quite a lot of parents, not all parents, but quite a lot of parents make a real effort to contribute towards your astronomical cost of your college education. And very, very few of them would give the same amount of help to a non-relative. So that is an example of evolutionary biology, I would argue, naturally favoring close relatives. Now, here we get to the heart of the matter. My contention is that one of the very unusual things about the human brain is that although it started off as a product of evolution, which Mm -hmm. we can talk about if you want to, through what I call a sort of bootstrapping process. In other words, beginning to critique its own evolutionary past, humans are likely to start feeling, well, okay, it may be okay for me to favor my close relatives, but that doesn't surely mean it's right for me to ignore the interests of others just because they're not related to me or because I'm never going to trade with them, so there's some mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. So over time, whether we're talking about people with a religious view or not, most systems of ethical accountancy, trying to determine what humans should or should not do, end up saying that we should be good to a wider range of people than evolutionary biology would predict. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about evolutionary ethics and um, the way in which kind of reciprocal altruism creates the context for um, uh, communities to then essentially call virtues out of each other for where your own investment is beyond those where that reciprocity um where you assume that reciprocity is going to be returned. Like uh, when you're hanging out with um, evolutionary biologists, how does that picture describing connect and push back to the kind of selfish gene account of humanity and altruism? And then something like uh, David Sloan Wilson and the questions around group selection. Okay. Again, there's an awful lot in all that. Now, There's a particular academic debate that's rumbled on for longer than many of us thought it would do within evolutionary biology about the unit of selection, as you point out, whether the sort of Richard Dawkins genes I view is good enough for explaining animal behavior and human behavior or whether it's not. Now, I think going back 30 years ago, the consensus among evolutionary biologists, is that while that genes I view probably was not good enough to explain everything about human behavior, it was good enough to explain everything about non-human behavior. 
That's shifted over the last 20 years or so. So the Mm -hmm. particular person you mentioned, D.S. Wilson and others, who are world-class evolutionary biologists, these are not people on the edge. More and more of them have suggested that Richard Dawkins' position is wrong. Now, whatever the answer to that particular question, which like a lot of frontier science, I don't know for sure what the answer is. It'll probably get sorted out one day. There's then the separate question about whether humans, because of our very important brains, are able to reflect on our actions and indeed to reflect on our system of values and ethics in a way that non-humans cannot. Yeah, that that uh, that. So you you're saying that. Either way that debate plays out, that as a species, we can choose to behave better than our inherited biological hardware of sorts would allow is uh, can be observed regardless. Spot on. So it's possible that to a certain extent, a few other species, one thinks of the other great apes, may similarly – have a sort of moral tension within themselves about wondering occasionally whether it's right or wrong to do something. Now, not everybody would agree with me on this, but I think when you look at the behavior, particularly, for example, of adult chimpanzees, you get the feeling they're a bit like watching a group of three to four-year-old humans. It's the beginnings of moral behavior. So, you know, a nine-month-old, even a 18-month-old child is not yet capable of being morally good or morally bad. However, either delighted with them or irritated their parents sometimes might be. But as they grow to become toddlers and then gradually move through to being three to four years old, we get the beginning of real moral behavior. So that when, if for example, you've got a a couple, let's say, of three and a half year olds, and one of them starts snatching what the other one is holding, almost all parents almost instinctively start saying, no, 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 darling, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. That's not right. How would you like it if your sister behaved like that? And that's the beginnings of moral education. So yes, Chimps, you know, possibly for all I know, we don't know much about these cetaceans, the dolphins and the whales, maybe even a few bird species at the beginnings. But I agree with you. It's only really humans that actually start reflecting on their ethical system and trying to work out a system of rules. Mm-hmm. And and how how would you describe the role of language or symbolic use of any way or rituals or – uh, narratives that we put ourselves in as a species as a way of uh, talking about interaction and the formation of the self uh, beyond you know what we're what we're born with so there's absolutely no doubt that language which usually is spoken language though one can have sign language and there are possibly other language systems that sometimes really occasionally develop in young children if, for example, they're not able to hear. But by and large, spoken language is utterly crucial in the formation of the self. It leads to a sort of positive feedback where the quality of the language improves and that affects overall cognitive ability. And 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 as, as you and many of your listeners will know, the saddest examples of this come from the small number of children who are treated appallingly either by their own parents or in orphanages and don't get any help in their language development. So there have been some very rigorous studies done in the orphanages in Romania at the end of the Ceausescu regime when a lot of the young children there had had virtually no language or other stimulation and have been left permanently damaged. Mm-hmm. It's as if you go through a window of opportunity. You don't fully catch up. And there are even more extreme examples of so-called feral children, children who have ended up almost going wild. There are very few of these. And of course, it's always possible that they had mental disabilities themselves. So one can't be quite as rigorous. But it looks as though language, which can be peer-to-peer, 
doesn't have to be language with parents or adults, though parents' language tends to be richer, is utterly crucial for the development, as I said, of the self and for an ethical system and beginning to ask those questions of who am I? Mm-hmm. And, and one of the reasons I find this part of the conversation important is there's been a number of uh, popular works recently around uh, the way human beings generate fictions to uh, shape, determine their life, like uh, the, the book Homo sapiens and such. Um, and and I wonder if there's uh, a sense that uh, awareness as an evolutionary biologist that our language is not kind of a, an epiphenomenon or something like that, but also it has a reciprocal relationship to changing our culture, changing our technology, and all those things then change us. That uh, that like the language of describing human culture and stuff as fiction is problematic, that it's playing a much more active role than we want to give credit to it. Absolutely. <laughs> there, there are two main problems when academics in general talk about anything to do with humanity, whether it's culture, whether it's religion, whether it's language, whether it's moral systems. One extreme is where many evolutionary biologists certainly were 20, 30 years ago, which is a very reductionist, narrow view, where it's all just driven by instinct and it's all pretty much, you know, then just developmental. You get a bit better as you get older, but that's it. The other mistake at the other extreme is where some sociologists were 50, 60, 70 years ago, where it's all interactions between people. And it's nothing from the individual. Now, I happen to be a very sort of middle of the road kind of person. Uh, I have a rather weak personality. I just like to get on with people. And of course, what I would say, therefore, is there's a bit of truth in both camps. Yes, humans start as individuals with a sort of, one hesitates even to use the language, but with a sort of set of instincts, a propensity for behaving in certain ways. And that is, quotes, in scare marks, genetic. But even before we're physically born, so even in the nine months or so in the womb, that is being affected by the surroundings. Now, initially, of course, that's just the mother. But as soon as we're born, it's the mother, it's a few significant other adults, it's children. And as we go through particularly the first sort of 15-ish years of our life, it's that interaction between the individual and the community that shapes who we are, which I think actually on a common sense level, most people know. It's why if you meet people from a completely different part of the world, you and they probably don't share a common language, but you recognize not all of each other's facial expressions because there's a role of culture in that, but you recognize a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You know if they're happy, if they're fearsome, if they're disgusted, if they're afraid. You won't pick up every nuance, but there's a commonality there. Yeah, and and I wonder um, how you describe that uh, the the emergence of religion in Homo sapiens. Like um, a lot of evolutionary biologists, evolutionary psychologists emphasize the way in which humans have this natural propensity to believe in supernatural spiritual agents, to believe in some type of dualism with an immortal soul. And so the, the, the evolutionary uh, trajectory is that our minds are structured to be religious, and now that we know they're structured that way, then obviously that's part uh, – it, it may have been something selected for before, but it doesn't need to be selected for now. Um, how do you – how do you kind of engage in those different views? Now, I'm very comfortable with the idea that being religious is a sort of template from our evolutionary history. There's a project I'm working on at the moment, which um, I'm co-leading with Robin Dunbar from the University of Oxford and Fraser Watts, who's from the International Society for Science and Religion. And it's called the Social Brain Hypothesis, and it's to do with the origins of religion. And there are a number of these different models now trying to account for religion. But again, as an evolutionary biologist, I tend to come back to the fact that anything interesting about us, whether it's music 
or language or ethics or religion will have its roots in our evolutionary history, but that won't explain everything about it that is interesting. Mm -hmm. You don't understand the difference between, you know, Bob Dylan and J.S. Bach from an evolutionary biological approach to music. You don't understand the difference between different poets from an evolutionary perspective on language. They're just the beginnings of understanding what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. So when, when you look at the history of our species, how would you describe the initial emergence of religious interaction, religious practice, religious culture? There's a quite nice body of work now beginning to emerge that actually religious practice was probably more important early on than a sort of set of creeds or beliefs. They came later. So religious practice may have had a number of functions in evolution. It may quite simply have been something to do with group coherence. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then later on, it morphed, it developed into issues to do with an ultimate authority determining what's right or wrong. And much later, questions about is there life after death and things like that. And, and part of the evidence for that is that when individuals, although we're not sure, and this goes back to the project that uh, Robin and Fraser and I are trying to do, when we look at people who are engaging in religious activities, it seems to have the same sort of physiological consequences in terms of changes in hormone levels and so on that you get from really good music or really good dance. Mm -hmm. And that, that suggests, no more than that, but that suggests a set of common origins. But again, the interesting thing about humanity is that as our brains got bigger, we then start reflecting on these sort of things. Uh, so I'm absolutely comfortable with the fact that now, you mentioned pluralism earlier on, there's this extraordinary diversity from people for whom religion is almost the most important factor in their life. It trumps family considerations. It trumps patriotic considerations. It trumps personal ambition. Through the mass of people across the world where religion is incredibly important, but so are family mm -hmm. and so are your status in the community, uh, through to the large number of people in some Western societies now who are very capable, as one knows, of leading pretty good lives themselves, having either actively <coughs> rejected evolution or just pretty much ignoring it. Mm -hmm. So when you talk in the, in the article about the kind of emergence of rationality and that helps shape ethical thinking, um, how does that rationality connect also to the growth or the expansiveness of binding? Like um, if, you, if you think throughout human history that religious traditions you can – that we have textual evidence for, you can see – a growth in the number of people, the diversity of the community that you're called to um, give, you know, have allegiance for. So how's the rationality and the in-group, out-group growth connected? So this is this is the, the bit of my argument in the Boyle lecture that I think is probably me rather than as in many of these public lectures where you're just trying to get a thread through a lot of what other people have done. And all I'm suggesting is that as our minds developed in evolutionary time, and a good model for this is often thinking of us going from being children to teenagers to young adults because you get the same phenomenon, mm -hmm. one starts to find oneself questioning more and more and one looks for some sort of coherence. And I think that the idea for many of us that you only favour other Muslims because you're Muslim, or you only favor other Jews because you're Jewish, just begins to be difficult to stack up. And of course, in most of the great religions, what you find is a very important strand 
which says, look, our religion may historically have started within one particular either ethnic or religious or geographical grouping, Mm -hmm. but that's not good enough. So, of course, in my own tradition, which is obviously the Judeo-Christian tradition, and now specifically for me the Christian tradition, stories in the New Testament like the Good Samaritan are precisely about arguing that the right way to behave is not always to either do what religious leaders do, but nor is it to favor those in your own religion, those in your own community, those in your own culture. It is to go the second mile, to favor those over oneself who are other. Mm -hmm. And and I wonder when I when I read it, what came to my mind is like uh, a frustration that comes up pretty consistently in popular discourse around religion and science is that when you see the ways in which religions manifest themselves as communities, and over time you can see a growth in how the uh, different religious traditions and communities um, are uh, growingly inclusive of the other as also the object of blessing, goodness, justice, and things. Um, why is it that so you that scientific atheists want to essentialize religion as necessarily tribal combative mythology, as opposed to seeing growth in it and then go, oh, maybe we should encourage and turn up the dials culturally in expressions of religious traditions that love their enemy, and pray for those that persecute them? Well, first of all, I actually have, although I'm not an atheist, obviously myself, as as, uh, I don't know if your listeners know, but I'm a mainstream priest in the Church of England in the Protestant tradition. I have been for 30 years. Um, I have a lot of sympathy for atheists who do dismiss religion because we live at a time where the behavior of some religious leaders in some of the major religions has been despicable. Mm-hmm. Now, thankfully, thankfully, there are a lot of great religious leaders, but but that pretty much undermines one's confidence in, in a lot of religions, whether one's inside the camp or outside it. Secondly, it's tough for a lot of religious believers to know how to interpret their own scriptures because it was easier probably at times in the past um the scriptures of course of all the world's religions were written a long time ago Mm -hmm. and things have moved on so trying to find if i can just concentrate on a, a christian use of language trying to find what the spirit is saying today to the churches is not easy the early days of christianity were really good at working out which bits of Judaism to keep and which bits to say we can move beyond that. But, you know, that was the time of the apostles, and and most of them were probably slightly more charismatic and gifted and inspired than most of us are today. So there ought to be a natural hesitation for us now to be quite as cavalier in changing things as sometimes in the past there have been changes. So it's not easy. Of course, part of me would love it if, as you said, uh, particularly the minority of atheists who dismiss religion unthinkingly, I'd love it for them to just give a bit more time and effort to debating. But then I'd love a bit, a lot more religious believers to give time and effort to listen to the critiques one gets from atheists and the questions one gets from agnostics. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things, even even the way you said it, like how do we understand uh, the spirit present today and what it, what the spirit's up to, like using language that way kind of shows um, consciousness of the evolution of a religious tradition. Right. And 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 so when um, are there other places or elements as an evolutionary biologist that you think uh, religious practitioners, religious leaders should uh, become more aware and conscious of? our tradition as something that's evolving, but also the way evolutionary reflection kind of shakes the finality off of parts of our tradition. I think the um, 19th century realization that actually by far the most straightforward explanation 
of the world one sees around them and the fossils and the fossil record and the geographical distribution of organisms is to think that it's older than a most straightforward literal reading of um, uh, Genesis or the Quran uh, or the Torah would suggest. That was one of the most fundamental decenterings of humans in, in history. It's absolutely alongside the Copernican revolution where the earth is no longer at the geographical center of the universe. And both of those are perhaps more important than Freud's realization with, with other late 19th century psychoanalysts that we're not as rational as we sometimes think we are. All of those between them can be read very positively for religion because they're all of us, or they're all of them about um, encouraging a bit more humility in humans, in how we read scriptures, how we understand the history, in my case, of the church, in how we lay down the law for what's right and wrong for ourselves and others. But of course, they can also cause a lot of defensiveness in religious believers. They can cause a sort of drawing up of the hatches, you know, a rejection mm -hmm. of all this stuff about the unconscious, a rejection that the world is more than a few, perhaps 10,000 years old, not many people, by the way, would now still claim that the uh, sun goes around the earth rather than vice versa, I admit. But, but there are a few of them still, too. Mm -hmm. So when, when you begin to think of particular questions that religious communities have wrestled with a long time, like why uh, humans can know the right thing to do and not do it, um, how does understanding our biological inheritance help us think more clearly and maybe gracefully about what human thinking is? That's a great question. Uh, I'm thinking back to the, 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 the bit where Paul in the New Testament writes about wanting to do what he knows is right, but not being able always to do it. I'm not sure we've actually moved forward, despite evolutionary biology and psychology, a great deal from that position, which is simply an acknowledgement that there is an internal dialogue in our minds that all of us at times are pulled one way and the other. And I don't know about you or anybody else listening, but it amazes me that at sometimes, admittedly only for rather brief periods, I can really be quite a decent human being. Uh, but then, of course, for so much of the day, it seems to get overlayered with irritations by me where I'm far more judgmental of others than I am of myself. Not sure, as I say, that evolution, biology, psychology add a huge amount to that, except, of course, that they do give a sort of scientific underpinning of that realization. We have now quite a good understanding of why humans have this sort of pull within their mind, because we've got a better idea about how the brain has evolved when we look at the brain of, for example, reptiles and compare that to lower mammals. Uh, mm -hmm. and then begin to compare it to the higher mammals, we can see that there isn't just one, as it were, mind at work. Language, again, gets difficult. There's either a sort of a modular structure going on or a bit of an internal dialogue with different parts of the mind being responsible for different areas of thought. In, in, when you think of... Um, uh, I, I can't remember the, the way you talked about it in the... Um, in the article, but that humans in, you know, or in some sense are, are not using their rational factory faculties all the time to get at the truth, but to get at reproduction. And how does like becoming aware of that change the way you start to think about uh, being human and seeking after truth? Great. So I find this is a very good way of understanding what in Scripture, in the Christian and Jewish Scriptures, uh, the language used is, is sin, a falling mm -hmm. short. So not every sin falls into this category, but a lot of uh, my shortcomings are due to my own selfishness. So that's putting either me first or the interests of my loved one's uh, or very close relatives, or those with whom I trade first. Uh, that's not something we're encouraged to do in Scripture. The thrust of the message of the Judeo-Christian Scriptures is precisely moving away from uh, a tight family, so an Adam and Eve and a Cain and Abel, where even within that, of course, 
you can get disastrous behaviors. Moving away from that, moving away from just the focus on Abraham and, and his family, moving away from just Israel, moving away from um, just the Jewish people towards the inclusion of all of humanity. And indeed, one book that struck me very much, which is written by somebody who has no truck religion at all, Peter Singer, mm -hmm. and who is quite often vilified by those with the religious belief, but Peter Singer's attempt, a successful attempt in my view, to include non-humans within our moral compass. Yeah. No, and, and I think part of the reason religious people get upset with them is they're like the uh, abortion stuff. Not necessarily Absolutely. like they've read his book and thought about yep. the other 99% of it. Yeah. Um, so, and if I can just comment on that, yeah, so yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to agree with everything that Peter Singer argues for because I would have a very mainstream position, which is that every one of us has an especial place in God's eyes. And that, I think, means that one cannot have a utilitarian perspective on how to treat humans, whether they're born yet or not yet born. Mm -hmm. in Does, by the way, just to interrupt you, doesn't immediately equate with an attempt to have legislation that forbids all categories of abortion, but it suggests that one would want to give a very high status to the position of any created human. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think one of the reasons that, like, that's a topic that should be informed by thoughtful investigations in science that isn't. And so it gets ideological and then people say stuff that just seems like nonsense because they're doing what their tribe wants them to do. And there's bound to be uh, some more sophisticated reflection. And um, in that, in, in that actually, like one of the questions that comes up in thinking about evolutionary biology is how after you see the big picture um, today from Darwin on, um, how would you talk about the idea of purpose in the history of life and culture? So for a Darwinian, in a narrow sense, an evolution biologist just thinking, for example, about rabbits, there is no doubt that, roughly speaking, the purpose of rabbits is to produce as many rabbits as possible and get them to survive into the next few generations. And it's the same with giraffes and jellyfish and oak trees. So for humans, I would see purpose, just like I argued earlier, about things like music. Yes, the roots are in evolution biology. So most people, not everybody, but most people either want to have children and bring them up and see them having reasonably good lives. Or if they don't, they're pretty concerned about nieces and nephews. Or if they don't have nieces and nephews, at least people they know. But there's more to purpose for a human. So I have a completely conventional religious faith in the Christian tradition and would be very comfortable with purpose being seen about trying, and I fail in this, of course, but trying to lead my life in conformity with what God would have me being, doing, and living. Mm -hmm. So one of the – we only have a few minutes left, and one of the questions that um, – that I would be help. It would help me, and I think help a lot of people that are wrestling in the series with religion and science. Is how do you understand the relationship between an explanation of a cause gathered between you know one avenue of scientific inquiry and the in that relationship to the justification you might have as a as a Christian in holding a belief. Because I think there's this tension where sometimes our cultural assumptions about the finality or absoluteness of science that adjust that that it's no longer justified to hold a belief, say that you are known and loved by God, um, when there's an explanation of how religion emerged in human consciousness and how uh, we desire to have that sense of ultimacy. So, Got it. Yeah. So. The response I'd give, which is not my response, it's a very standard response, is that one can understand explanations operating at a number of levels. <clears throat> so 
the, one of the classic examples given is if one's trying to explain why a kettle is boiling, depending on the context of the question, it's perfectly valid to say it's boiling because the heat element is on and therefore the molecules are moving faster and more and more of them reach 100 degrees centigrade and that's the boiling point of water. But it's equally valid to say because a friend's called round and I've offered my friend a cup of tea or coffee and I'm making it for both of us. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not in contradiction. So it's absolutely possible to talk about God's purpose for your life or my life, humanity's life, the earth as a whole, and talk about, as an evolutionary biologist, how on earth, after roughly four and a half thousand million years on earth, how on earth have we got to this point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think it's important, and, and, and I really just wanted to have you lay that out, because a lot of Christians or people that have left the church just believe the conflict between science and religion is such that you can't have thoughtful reflection on uh, the phase transition of water in a in a kettle, and at the same time think that uh, the the suffering presence of God was revealed on the cross. That's a great end point, if I might say, Trip. If I'd been interviewing you rather than vice versa, so thank you. I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> Oh, it's been a real treat, and I, I'm real excited about the new project. What was it called? The so the project I'm working on is 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 the shorthand version is uh, the social brain and the origins of religion. Awesome! And when will when will that come out in readable formats? Like most academic projects, I suspect we're going to be talking 18 months plus, to be honest. We're, we're bang in the middle, about two-thirds of the way through the field work and the conceptual work. But it's going well. It's going well. Awesome. Well, hopefully, uh, I'll, we'll get to talk again when it comes out. Thanks, Trip. All right. Good luck. Good luck.